Hey, welcome back, everybody. My guest tonight spent nearly 25 years in Congress working for the great state of Ohio, served four years as Speaker of the House, and just wrote a memoir about it all called On the House. Please welcome to a late show, former Speaker John Boehner. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much for being here. Stephen, it's good to be with you. I got, I got the book. I got, I got my own, I got my own drink here. I got a little, a uh, little Weller 12 bourbon. What do you, what you got? Anything right there? I've got a little uh, Cabernet right here. Um, well, listen, uh, I've, 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 I've really enjoyed uh, uh, reading excerpts of your book. I haven't made my way all the way through it, but there are some juicy parts. You are candid uh, in your memoir. I certainly hope you'll be as candid with me as you are in the book. Can I, can I get that promise from you? Uh, you can get that, Stephen. I've, listen, I've been candid, straightforward my whole life including my years in politics. And you're going to get the same treatment, maybe a little more. Now, most people know you as the guy who grew up sleep, uh, sweeping the floor of his dad's bar in Ohio. And eventually, you make it to be one of the most powerful people in the United States, the Speaker of the House. I want to ask you about that job. So few people, I think it's altogether like 54 people have held that job over the last 200 and some odd years. What do you think that job requires? Well, it requires a lot of patience, uh, but uh, most of the skills I learned growing up at my dad's bar are what helped me do a good job as speaker. Now, you know, first thing you have to learn is to be the art of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. You know, that drunk's me sitting at the end of the bar all night. You don't want to fight with this guy, but you don't agree with him. So you got to find a way to disagree without being disagreeable. Really helped me in politics. Second lesson is, you have to learn to deal with every jackass that walks in the door. <laughs> Trust me, these are the two skills that helped me most when I was Speaker of the House. I, def I definitely want to get to some of those jackasses in just a moment. But who do you think has done a good job as Speaker over the years? Who do you admire in that respect? Uh, you know, I think most everybody who has risen to that job has done a pretty good job. Uh, whether it was Newt Gingrich or Nancy Pelosi, uh, you know, these people did a nice job as uh, Speaker. It's a tough job. They got uh, 435 members, all independently elected, owe you nothing. And, uh, and you know, you're trying to uh, help move them to do good things on behalf of the country. That owe you nothing thing is kind of interesting to me. How do you corral people who don't have any particularly loyalty to you as the speaker? Um, uh, because they all got to answer to their constituents. Y you said in 2011, when you were elected to the top job, you became the, quote, mayor of Crazy Town. I remember living in downtown Crazy Town starting around 2010. What do you mean by that? Do you, do you think you could tame the crazies? Uh, listen, I did my best to try to corral them, to try to move them in the right direction. But, you know, some of these people got elected in 2010, 2012. I mean, they were, they were, they were way out there. Uh, but the American people sent them there. Uh, and uh, and I had to do my best with what I was what I was dealt. Uh, I've always believed that you got to play the cards you were dealt. And every morning I wake up and I kept looking to have five aces. Still haven't gotten five aces any morning. Uh, but you got to play the cards you're dealt, and I played them as best I could. I'm, I haven't played a lot of poker, sir. But if you get five aces, somebody's <laughs> cheating. <laughs> you're hard on Ted Cruz. In in oh, this book. Oh, you mean book. Lucifer? You mean Lucifer in the flesh? <laughs> yes, and that's a lot of flesh for Lucifer to fill out there. In the audiobook, you say, um, uh, do we have this? Do we have this audio? Can we play this, Jim? Take it from me. You'll never know where you'll end up. That's freedom. I'll raise a glass to that any day. P.S. Ted Cruz, go f yourself. Now, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's been said that everybody hates Ted Cruz, and on behalf of everybody, let me agree with that. But what made you what made you uh, have so much contempt for the man? Well, this guy didn't even serve in the, in the House. He served in the United States Senate, and and he didn't do anything in the Senate except make noise and come over to the House side and stir up uh, some of my more conservative members. I don't know if I call them conservative. Some of my knuckleheads. Uh, into doing things that made no sense whatsoever. 
Such and, as? Uh, like what? Uh, such as the government shutdown in 2013 would be the prime example. Sure. I told them for months, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. They're going to shut down the government to get rid of Obamacare. Now, Barack Obama's president, Harry Reid's the majority leader in the Senate, uh, they were never, ever going to go there. Uh, and uh, we were, they were, Ted Cruz and these knuckleheads were setting us up to shut the government down. And I just, I kept telling members, this makes no sense. But in the book, uh, there's a favorite Bainerism in there. And that is, a leader without followers is just a man taking a walk. <laughs> and uh, next thing I know, all my troops are going to, uh, to my right. Uh, and as the leader, I've got no choice but to jump out in front of them and uh, to be their leader. But it was one of the dumber things I've ever seen. Anyway, Ted Cruz was the mastermind behind this plan. And so uh, he's really the only person in the book I really take uh, to task, and I take him to task. Now, why do you think that you were going for a walk? Why do you think that your own party jumped so far in a crazy direction? Uh, I'm not saying it's necessarily your responsibility, but it was certainly while you were a member of, your, uh, a leader, member of the leadership of your own party, do you see a, a, an inflection point within the party where they started to go so crazy right? Well, it, listen, uh, we were at just at the beginning of, uh, uh, we had the internet, but all the, the social media stuff was just starting to come on to, to, to the scene. Uh, but we had uh, talk radio, mostly conservative, all these cable news channels, all they did were politics all night. And, uh, and what happened uh, around uh, 2009, 2010, 11 is that uh, uh, the right wing media just went really. They wanted noise and they wanted more noise. And these people were only too happy to give them noise and they got a lot of air time. And so uh, uh, I saw the beginnings of this. It's gotten a lot worse since. And the problem is not just on the far right, it's on the far left as well. Uh, people who get elected uh, know how to use social, social media, know how to use uh, talk radio and the cable people. Uh, to uh, to build their brand, if you will. They're noisemakers. Uh, gets them a lot of attention, helps them raise the money, uh, but it doesn't do anything on behalf of the country. Well, I'll, I'll uh, let me just, for a moment, I'll accept your premise that uh, both sides do this, though I'm, I think that the Republicans have gotten better at having a media arm that helps inflate their worst instincts than the Democrats uh, do. If, if, but if both sides do that, how come Nancy Pelosi can corral her crazies and you can't corral yours? Well, she's done, uh, frankly, a better job of holding uh, her party together. I've watched it over the 30 years that I've been around. Uh, Congress, uh, Democrats are always more willing to stick together uh, than Republicans are. They, well, it's wait a second. The very, I don't think the that's very true. Nature, the Republicans the very have nature. a monolithic quality, and the Democrats are always a coalition of diverse interests. Uh, Republicans tend to be more independent-minded than Democrats. I've just seen it over the years. And, uh, but anyway, but she's done a, Pelosi's done a pretty good job of holding them together thus far. All right. Um, let's talk about uh, January 6th, an incredibly heartbreaking day that none of us ever thought we would see. Um, you wrote that Donald Trump incited that bloody insurrection and the legislative terrorism that I'd witnessed speak as speaker had now encouraged actual terrorism. So logically, aren't you saying that Donald Trump is a political terrorist? No, I, I, don't, I don't need to describe words to him, but I just thought that what he was saying before the election about they're going to steal the election, they're going to steal the election. And uh, and then after the election, claiming the election was stolen without ever providing one ounce of evidence. I kept looking, well, where's the evidence? And, and as someone who voted for Donald Trump, I've got to tell you, I felt abused. Uh, the loyalty and trust of his supporters, uh, and here he is lying to them about the outcome of the election. Uh, all of that uh, tended uh, to incite an awful lot of people to show up on January 6th. Uh, and then uh, uh, this, this demonstration got taken over by some real whack jobs uh, who turned it into uh, some really serious violence. Do you, think, do you think Biden has any hope of getting people to compromise? Since you write in the book that many of the Republicans... For many of the Republicans, it's not about principle, it's about chaos. Can you negotiate with agents of chaos? Well, listen, uh, Stephen, 
uh, governing in America as divided as it is, is, is very difficult. And frankly, both parties are being held hostage by the loudest voices in their parties. And, uh, and as a result, it's going to be really, really tough. If Joe Biden were to sit down with Mitch McConnell and begin to work out something on infrastructure, the right would crucify McConnell. And frankly, the left would crucify Biden. And so, God bless him, uh, there's, there's a way to get there, but it's going to take a lot of courage on, on behalf of the leaders to do it. We have to take a quick break, uh, Mr. Speaker, but when we come back, I got a classic speed round on 10 people in Washington I'd like the Speaker to weigh in on. Stick around.